Hi, I'm Gail Trotter, host of The Gail Trotter Show. I'm a liberty-loving, tyranny-hating lawyer based in your nation's capital. My goal is to keep you informed and to be your advocate in Washington, D.C. We are gaining subscribers by the week, and I want to welcome everybody who is newly subscribed to this channel. I really appreciate it, and I want to thank all the longtime subscribers. You've been here since the very beginning, and I appreciate all the encouragement and the great comments that you're leaving on this channel. I read them all, I respond to them, and they help me to develop new topics to talk about and to make sure that I'm answering the questions that you want answered. Well, today has been quite a combustion of interesting things, I will say, that have gone on this week with Joe Biden. Many people call him Slow Joe, and I don't know if you have listened to any of his uh, press conferences where he's taken uh, questions from the press and he says, well, I've been told I shouldn't answer any of these questions, and they hurry him off the stage. And if you listen to any of the speeches he's given, he slurs his words, not like a drunk person does, but by someone who is not in full command of his language skills. And I find this to be really disturbing, given the extraordinary pressure that America is under right now. We see the pressure at the border that was stopped during the Trump administration, and Joe Biden appointed or nominated his vice president, Kamala Harris, to take care of the problem at the border, which is not a crisis. And of course, if there's anything wrong, it's always President Trump's fault. But Kamala has uh, completely uh, been derelict in her duties of trying to stem this because you almost think that the Democrats want more voters pouring over our southern border. So we see that going on, and there's nothing that that we Americans who are just citizens and not in positions of power can do about it right now other than contact our congressmen and women and get them to do hearings and investigations and try to really put the pressure on the Biden administration. And if we had a functioning mainstream media, they would be doing the same thing because they would understand not only how catastrophic it is to our economy and how it really tears apart the fabric of our nation, but also at the time when the mainstream media is lecturing us about being vaccinated and wearing masks and fighting the conspiracy theorists of COVID, you would think that they would be concerned about all of these people flooding over the border who have not been properly screened for health issues, and particularly COVID. So you see yet again another hypocrisy illustrated by the mainstream media. And just this week, we see war breaking out in the Middle East, and that is such a change from what we saw with the Abraham Accords that took place under President Trump and his administration. We saw overtures being made by Arabic countries to Israel, and this was all trending in the right direction. And now we see there are little, literal rockets being fired at our close ally, Israel, and you see people like AOC saying outrageous things on Twitter about the nation of Israel, and yet the Democrat Party isn't censoring her, it isn't uh, calling her out or opposing what AOC and the squad is saying about this conflict in the Middle East. And so that's falling down. The world is on fire. And I think something that affects us more closely at home uh, People are driving for hours trying to find a gas station that ha still has gas. Now, I'm sure you're probably not old enough to remember this, but those of us who are older remember the 1970s when President Jimmy Carter was in office and we had gas lines and we had shortages. And his solution to that was, oh, if you're cold, put on a sweater. And he talked about the malaise of the American people, and yet he, as president, did not do anything to relieve the energy crisis that we suffered under President Carter's administration. And so all of us who were advocating for President Trump in the fall and saw all the wonderful things that he and his administration did in their first four years, despite the entire opposition 
of Washington, D.C. Most of the people in the federal government are Democrats or liberal, and they were fighting him tooth and nail. So the fact that he was able to accomplish anything, particularly being a neophyte, someone who had not been a politician before and someone who wasn't used to how uh, entrenched the deep state and the opposition of the bureaucracy would be to him, it was really remarkable what President Trump was able to accomplish. Now the bureaucracy, they are all working on behalf of President Biden and see what is happening. If you have to drive two hours and go to 20 different gas stations to try and find gas, you might say, why would any president stand for this? Why would any Congress stand for this? And yet it is of a piece of their political policy preferences. They want to end energy in the United States. Essentially, they want to cast our lot with these unproven technologies that have serious costs, like we saw in Texas just a few months ago when the entire grid broke down and people in Texas froze to death because they didn't have access to energy. And there was a serious uh, human catastrophe that happened in Texas. And yet part of the problem with that was that Texas was relying on solar energy and wind power, these turbines that also kill a lot of birds. And we thought that the Democrats were pro-environment, but apparently they are more pro-wind, windmills, wind energy. So you would you might think that the gas shortages are just part and parcel of where we're going to end up as a country if we follow the Green New Deal and the policy preferences of the Democrat Party and of the Biden administration. And you heard it said over and over again during the presidential election and during the Democratic presidential primaries that Joe Biden was the moderate of the Democrat Party. Well, he's certainly not governing like a moderate certainly not a centrist and certainly all of the things that he has done and his very, very short tenure as president has created the situation where we are right now. We're seeing a lot more aggression by Iran. And I wrote a piece several years ago about the threats of radical Islamic terrorism. And you might not remember this, but Iran tried to blow up a restaurant in Georgetown uh, several years ago trying to blow up the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United States. We also had ISIS calling for attacks in the mainland of the United States. And I wrote a piece talking about how if we had concealed carry, then the ISIS terrorists wouldn't know who would be able to oppose them. And so it would be good if we had more sane and law abiding people who were trained and had the permission to conceal carry so that they could make sure that they could defend our country because we are a self-reliant people and we don't expect the government to do everything for us. And I think we all saw last summer what happens when we rely on the government to protect us. We saw out of control rioting that the mainstream media called mostly peaceful protests. And we continue to see the homicide rate and the violent crime rate skyrocket in cities across the country. And this is a real problem. So all of these things are happening and Americans are not stupid. They understand what's going on. And I think there's a lot of unrest in our spirits right now. And I think it's really important for people to take responsibility for themselves. So it's interesting to see there's going to be a big Supreme Court decision next year. They're going to hear oral arguments. It's going to be briefed about our Second Amendment rights. And I just want to share with you quickly what it takes to get a concealed carry license in Washington, D.C. So first, you have to be of the right age. You have to not have committed crimes. You need to not be a substance abuser. You have to certify that you don't you don't meet any of the disqualifications for having a concealed carry permit. So you start this process, you have to go for a class that is 16 hours long. So that's essentially uh, two eight hour days of classes. And then once you complete that class, you take a test 
and it has some very basic questions on it and some harder questions that w you would not know just from common sense. It's based on the law. And then after you complete that 16 hour class that costs around $350, $400, then you have to go do two hours of gun practice at the range and you take a test at the range and you have to show that you have accuracy and competency at certain distances, five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet. And then after you do that, then you have to start the bureaucratic process. Now, I want to tell you that the people in the firearms control section of the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department are wonderful. They are true public servants and they are so kind and friendly and they are trying really, really hard. But I will tell you, it's a very frustrating process to go through. You fill out the paperwork and some of the paperwork is not consistent with the rules. And then you, you have to sign up for an appointment. You have to wait weeks to get an appointment to go to the DCMPD. You take your paperwork. You have to have a lot of documentation. And then maybe you're missing one piece. Then you have to start the process over again. You have to go online, get another appointment, go back. And once you get there, you have all of your paperwork and you realize, oh, they require you to have purchased your firearm before you try to get the concealed carry permit. And it has to either have been registered before or you have to purchase it and you must have it sent to a federal firearm licensee who runs the FBI background check. So that's more money to get your weapon that you buy out of state mailed. So you pay for the weapon, you pay for mailing fees, you have to pay for a transfer fee to, from whatever store you bought it from to the DC uh, federal firearm licensee, then you have to make an appointment with them. Then you have to go to their offices and go online and fill out the federal background check. And then you still don't have your firearm. You still don't have your legal permission to carry to defend yourself in DC. No, then you need to make another appointment with the DC MPD and that can take several more weeks. So then you go through that process. You go back to the DC MPD and then you have to pay $35 to get your finger fingerprinted. Even if you've been fingerprinted before, like for me, if you become a lawyer, you have to be fingerprinted to join the Virginia State Bar. I'm sure many other states do that as well. So you're paying $35 to get fingerprinted again. And then you have to pay another $75 for the concealed carry license uh, application fee. So you can see all of these expenses are adding up and the time that it takes is really a lot. It's excessive. So apparently they are, DCMPD is supposed to get back to you in 90 days, but they explain now they're explaining right now, they're not going to get back in 90 days. It's going to take longer than 90 days. So let's say it's May 10th when you have done all these things and gotten all your permissions and filled out all your forms and showed all your documentation and paid all your fees, May, June, July, August, and imagine what can happen in just one summer. Think about what happened last summer. And unfortunately, if you want to be in compliance with the DC law, you're out of luck. You cannot carry until you have that permission. You cannot legally carry until you have that permission and you're not getting that permission for at least 90 days, which is more if you count the time that it took to take the training class and the time it takes to go do the federal background check and to research what firearm you want and to have it mailed to the federal firearm licensee. So think about all the cost and all the time that this is taking. And yet at the same time, the cities have been on fire, the homicide rates are going up. And so you're really just pre preventing the law lawful, the sane, the law abiding from possessing firearms to protect themselves and other vulnerable members of the community. And it is just outrageous. And the Gun Owners of America, which is a gun lobbying group, gun rights lobbying group, pro Second Amendment, they said that half of the country now is a Second Amendment sanctuary area. So I'm surprised it's only half the country, but we do understand that there are many Democrats and liberals who do not support our Second Amendment. 
But just think about that at a time when government is failing to do its duty, government, that same government failing to do its core duty is preventing DC citizens, and this is similar in New York City and other liberal bastions, they are preventing you from being able to defend yourself. And you think about all the fees that come with this too, and it is just outrageous that the citizens put up with this. And I will tell you that if you go to DCMPD, so many of the people trying to get their concealed carry licenses or register firearms are African American women. And they understand that over 2 million defensive gun uses happen a year. And so they understand that this right, the Second Amendment right, is their right as American citizens. And they understand that it's a precious right. But it is really awful to put these oppressive fees on the people who live in D.C. and they are subject to this rising homicide rate and the amount of bureaucratic regulation that you have to go through. So I just hope that some, for some miracle that the left and the Democrats will understand how pernicious this treatment of our Second Amendment rights is and they will reverse course and bring down these barriers, these undue burdens on a fundamental right that is in the black and white text of our Constitution. And I hope you will let your legislators know. I hope you will write to the White House. I hope you will call your congressmen, your congresswomen, and I hope you will work at your state and local level to assure that our fundamental rights are protected. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe below, share this episode and the channel with your friends, anybody who cares about what it means to be an American and what our fundamental rights are and how we can defend them. And you can like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter, you can find me on Instagram, and please comment down below on what you think about the Democrats' attacks on our Second Amendment rights as we're seeing essentially the world burning down around us. And thank you so much for joining me.